Right now, we want to uh, really excitedly say welcome to Garth Lenz. And Garth came all the way from Canada. He's a TEDx speaker and a first prize winner in the photography competition for Time Magazine and the New York Times. Garth is touring for his touring exhibition, The True Cost of Oil, and it's touched people around the world with its stunning and evocative portraits of the impacted places. His, his images of Alberta's tar, Canada's tar sands and Royal Region were awarded first place in social documentary nets, searching for a 21st century landscape contest. Garth has been recognized with many other awards, and we are really honored to have you here today. Thank you. Is that coming through okay? I, I just wanted to also say that um, the images I've just noticed are kind of all squished in, sort of truncated. Um, but uh, I'm going to be giving a, a full-length presentation this evening at the Sunrise Center, uh, courtesy of the generosity of Laurie Grace. If you're out there, Laurie, thank you. Uh, thank you, even if you're not out there. Um, that will be at uh, 7 o'clock at the Sunrise Center. For any of you that are able to come, it would be wonderful to see you there. So, I think people are well, going to ask me difficult questions and I'll get <laughs> to answer. I'm not Peter Asmus, I'm the other Peter of the three that spoke earlier, I'm Peter Joseph. And I want to thank Garth for the good feedback he's been giving us about uh, how urgent it is to stop this Keystone XL pipeline, which is designed to bring the oil down from the tar sands. The Keystone XL pipeline is a catheter that will run through our country to get this stuff out of Alberta, down to refineries, and then out into the rest of the world for sale. Uh, I also want to thank Garth for changing my life. Uh, last summer, um, the summer of 2011, I should say, I first learned about the tar sands. And I was astounded that I didn't know more about the tar sands. Here I'm a climate activist for already six years, and this had not come across my radar screen. And the more I learned, the more outraged I became. If you've seen the pictures of the tar sands, you cannot help but have a, a reaction of outrage that we are doing this to the earth in one of the most beautiful places on the earth. So Garth really changed my life. He motivated me to go to Washington, get arrested for the first time in my life at the White House. And, you know, here I am. I'm doing this full board. Thank you. It's partly because of you. This is an incredible presentation. I think that nobody who really gets the deepest impact of what humans are doing to the planet to get to the last drop of oil, if you get that, uh, there's no, there's no way you can escape from committing to doing something about it. That's how deep this kind of work is. It goes to the very heart of the matter, which is an emotional, an emotional reaction to what we're doing, to get this energy that we could do without. So, Garth, could you please start by explaining? What is the significance of the Canadian tar sands? Well, um, the Alberta tar sands, or oil sands as they're also referred to, is the largest energy project that the world has ever seen. And these are the third largest proven oil reserves in, in the world. <clears throat> By proven, they mean that we know that we can technologically access them and they're economically viable. Now, they weren't proven oil reserves when the research started back in 1963 because they weren't economically viable and didn't know how to get to them. The actual tar sands reserves are far, far larger than what reflects being the third largest proven oil reserves. Actually, there is a fair amount of informed thought that feels that with te technological advances that will come in the future, that the amount of tar sands reserves that could be exploited and processed and refined and then released into the atmosphere as burnt fossil fuels may be two or three times greater than those of Saudi Arabia. 
they are also the single largest source of foreign oil to the United States. I'm always kind of amused when I hear American politicians saying, you know, we need the Keystone XL pipeline to free us from dependence on foreign oil. I feel like somebody maybe needs a geopolitical lesson. Canada is still an independent country. Um, the real issue with, with, uh, with the Alberta tar sands is that it's very, very high carbon footprint oil, higher than more traditional forms. And this tends to hold true for most of what we refer to as extreme oil. We used to hear a lot about people, all of a sudden, the silence is deafening. And that's because of technological advances and the new reserves that, as a result of that, are opening up, not just tar sands, but shale gas, of course, a very, very prominent topic here in California, deep sea offshore oil drilling. All of these kinds of tight oil or extreme oil have greater ecological costs and cost more to, to recover, which ties us also to a much higher um, energy cost. So bad for the economy, bad for the climate. climate. The Keystone XL pipeline is a pipeline similar to the proposed gateway pipeline that would cut across northern British Columbia. It's a pipeline to an access route to export the oil. It, it's not about energy self-sufficiency for the United States. In Canada, the discussion is all about the need for these pipelines because currently when we sell the 99% of the oil that comes out of the tar sands that we sell in the United States, we're getting anywhere from $20 to $40 a barrel less per barrel of oil than we would if it were on the market in either Asia or Europe. So that's the issue for the Keystone XL pipeline. What you will get is two to 4,000 temporary pipeline construction jobs that will last for a couple of years. After that, yes, I guess there are going to be some refinery jobs. Probably just a handful, because of course refineries are highly mechanized. Well, just a few months ago, within a single month, the Obama administration apparently produced over 250,000 new jobs. So two to 4,000 temporary jobs does not seem to me a fair exchange for the risk of a pipeline that cuts through your agricultural heartline, heartland. Even the very conservative provincial government of British Columbia has said no to the Gateway Pipeline. Again, a pipeline that would take diluted bitumen, that's diluted, not diluted, um, to the port of Kitimat, again, for shipping to Asia. Well, the current provincial government of British Columbia does not really care so much about the environment. Their main issue is, as they accurately put it, British Columbia takes all of the risk and gets none of the benefit. And from what I understand, that would be exactly the same situation for the Keystone XL pipeline. Thank you. That was a very complete answer. <laughs> How did you get started as a conservation photographer and then onto the tar sands? And during your documentation of the tar sands, what are what is the most uh, interesting or harrowing story you have to tell us? Well, um, I, I'm originally trained as a classical pianist and um, was doing, had a, had a foot in, in both camps for quite a long time. Um, much like Ansel Adams, I don't know how many of you know, but Ansel Adams was a very serious and fine uh, classically trained pianist. And when he was about 32, he decided that he would commit himself full time to photography. And um, likewise, at a certain point in, in my life, in uh, 1992, I left my day job of, of teaching piano because I, I was invited to participate in uh, a book called Clear Cut, The Tragedy of Industrial Forestry, in which clear cut logging in every province, state, and territory in North America was, was documented, and, and I was asked to produce images from both the west coast of British Columbia and across the western boreal of Canada, the, the northern parts of BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. 
And in that process, I fell in love with these incredible, diverse boreal forests of, of northern Canada, the most uh, likely the most effective terrestrial carbon sink we have in the world. And made repeated trips back until in 2005, I had a, a, a large commission that, that took me into the field for 70 days uh, to visit every province and territory in Canada to photograph the boreal forest. And in that time, I went to the Alberta tar sands in northern Alberta. It was only there a couple of days. Um, I had a few hours in a helicopter to photograph. And as the English say, was absolutely gobsmacked by the scale of this enterprise. And, you know, as a conservation photographer and environmental photojournalist, I'm looking for that merger of critical issues which are also very visual. And I found in the tar sands what I thought and, and still feel is perhaps the most um, visceral and clear visual representation of what's wrong with our addiction to fossil fuels. A very, very clear contrast between those areas that are industrialized and those areas which are potentially about to be industrialized. And, and so this, this was a, you know, a very, very interesting photographic project for me and a very rewarding one because I felt that it really typified and made visually clear to people what we're, what we're risking, what the true cost of our connection to fossil fuels is. Um, in terms of the most harrowing, it's very hard to, to say. I mean, certainly when I've been in the small community of Fort Chippewan and heard the stories of some of the indigenous people and heard about the cancer rates and, and talked to Chief Alan Adam and, and other people there about what that's meant to their community, that certainly is very harrowing. But I think the most harrowing thing is just to see that landscape and the scale of change in that landscape. A landscape where the huge amount of sulfur and pollutants that go into the landscape meaning creates its own weather patterns. When you're at the McMurray uh, Airport chartering a plane or a helicopter, and it's only about 20 or 30 miles from the industrialized area, they can't tell what the weather's going to be like because the tar sands and the tailings ponds create their own weather patterns there. So it's, it's quite a remarkable situation. Wow. Would anyone in the audience like to pose a question to Garth Lentz? is the expansion of the industrial areas and the consumption of the intact boreal forest ecosystem. Because it is under the boreal forest and wetlands of northern Alberta that you find the bitumen, this tar-like substance that through great technological feats in consumption of water and energy and the production of carbon eventually results in synthetic oil. Um, yeah, so it, it occurs to me that your work is 
similar to or analogous to what Jim Baylock has done with Chasing Knives. How many of you have seen Chasing Knives? It was just broadcast on the National Geographic Channel on uh, Friday. Uh, what he's done is to create the visual of what we're doing to the cryosphere. And what you're doing, Garth, is creating the visual to what we're doing to this forest. And uh, it seems kind of stupid for such a smart species to be doing that to the place where it lives. Um, so, could you describe for us what will happen if the Keystone XL pipeline gets approval? Um, well, what it will do is, right now, basically, they're, they've got a bottleneck where they can only refine and get to market 1.7 million barrels of oil per day. What that means is they'll be able to get another 830,000 barrels per oil a day to market. So that's certainly going to feed the expansion of, of the tar sands and make it possible. But that's the whole infrastructure of Keystone and Gateway and reversing the pipelines to go uh, west to east, the Trailbreaker pipeline from Montreal to Portland, Maine, that's all about expanding that capacity. Yeah, I can't speak to um, the in situ projects, although it's about, about they say about eighty percent of the land mass that is disturbed is, is currently in situ. But definitely, there's more in situ the massive network of, of pipelines and, and subterranean um, uh, a pumping of, of, of polluted water, similar to hydrofracking on a massive scale. But the, the mines themselves, the footprint of them, excluding the tailings ponds is about the size of Greater Chicago. They have already either approved land leases or mines that would see a, a greater than tenfold expansion of that footprint just by mines. The tailings ponds are the largest toxic impoundments in the world. Um, single tailings ponds up to 9,000 acres, that's two-thirds the size of the island of Manhattan. Uh, there's 19 tailings ponds right now. When you have a mine, you have tailings ponds. So, you know, if you figure five mines, 19 tailings ponds, tenfold increase, you know, another 50 mines, maybe another 200 tailings ponds. Yes, your Prime Minister bragged that it was on the scale of building the pyramids. Well, he said, yeah, it's a, a, um, a you know, development of epic proportions similar to creating the, the pyramids or the Great Wall of China, only bigger. Which it is, you know, when you see it from the air, I, and there's something kind of seductive about this huge machinery and just the massive scale of what we've done. Um, and I think there's kind of that danger in that, that seduction to it. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. David over here. Do they keep a straight face on their restoration plans? Um, yes, they do. Now, uh, they are legally required to return the land to its original state. Now, when the mines are created, about 60% of the, of the footprint of the mines actually comes from where wetlands originally were as opposed to boreal forest. They don't even know how to recreate a wetland. There's no attempt to do that. The Alberta government, which is a huge, huge proponent of the tar sands and actively lobbies for things like the Keystone XL pipeline in, uh, in Washington has only managed to certify 0.05% of the land as reclaimed. We just got the, the sign that they're going to bring the big hook up in a minute. Um, again, we can only touch the surface, no pun intended, um, in, in this amount of time and we need to be respectful to, of, the other, um, of the other presenters and Hannah's budget. Um, Please come, if you, if you would like, to the Sunrise Center. Um, maybe someone can, can let us know the address of that. 7 o'clock tonight, I'll be giving a, a, a long presentation. We can stay there and, and chat for as long as, as we like, and you'll see the full hour-long presentation of this. And Thank you. Won't you. Be sorry. Thank you, you won't be very sorry. much. I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you. Thanks, man. You can Google Garth Lens and Ted.
in the same search and you will get his uh, TED Talk. It's really, really fantastic. We still have postcards that you can write a message to President Obama uh, asking him nicely to please reject the Keystone XL pipeline and respect the sweet poetry that he has offered us since uh, his inauguration. Thank you so much to Garth and to Peter J. Thank you very, very much for being on the What amazing, amazing images to remember. And the Summary Center, Hannah, do you know the address? I was just looking it up, trying to find it here. The Sunrise Center, Garth was mentioning. Garth is going to be there tonight. On Tamil Pies. Okay, on Tamil Pies Avenue in Cordoba Madera, just past Bank of America, and I think Art's going to be there at 6.30, I believe. Uh, so, or at 7 o'clock. So the Sunrise Center table is right outside, right behind this wall, so you can go check in with them and find out about the details to see Garth's extended presentation, which is extremely highly recommended. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to do that after you see the fantastic movie uh, from 350 Do the Math. 